All right. Can you hear me now? Okay. Wonderful. Much better. So, uh, so wonderful to see you all. Um, this is a exciting, um, anxious, uh, very open-ended day full of possibility. And you uh, are all here to think about yourself in ways that you've never thought of about yourself before, including uh, potentially as an MIT student. So, uh, my name is Nicholas Demancho. I'm the head of the architecture department, and uh, my job this morning, and of all our job, is to help you begin to think about uh, what that might be like and what that is. And uh, it will take much more than me. I wanted to quickly introduce some other leaders in the department who you'll see throughout the day uh, who are here uh, with us. So uh, there uh, I see Anna Mayachki, head of our SMARCS program, also a key member of the MRC faculty. Uh, John Oxendorf, uh, head of the Morningside Academy for Design, which you'll hear more about in a moment, and a, a key, also key structures faculty in the architecture department. Uh, Christoph Reinhardt, uh, head of our building technology program. Skylar Tibbetts, head of our undergraduate uh, program. Uh, Liam O'Brien, head of our uh, MRC program. Uh, and we, uh, 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 and in the back, uh, Timothy Hyde, head of history theory criticism and associate department head. Uh, we, uh, as a matter of principle, run our department together with um, student leadership. So I also wanted to introduce um, uh, Haris and Mara, um, head of the um, uh, our architecture students. What does ASC stand for? Council. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Hannah and Naya, um, uh, leaders in uh, uh, NOMAS, the National Organization of Minority Architects Student Chapter, also a key partner in um, uh, the way we run our department here. Um, all of you will tell me, am I missing anyone out who's here? I don't think so. Okay. So um, I wanted to start by telling you just a little bit about the background of MIT as a Department of Architecture, and then um, introduce you a little bit also to what's going on in the department right now and what you'll have a chance to be uh, a part of, for better or for worse, as you contemplate being here for the next couple of years. So one of the important, uh, uh, I'd say there are two key things to understand about MIT. Um, the first, uh, evidenced by these sepia tone photographs, is this is actually the first professional program of architecture in North America. Um, we graduated uh, our first uh, professional architecture students, uh, then at the bachelor's level in 1868. Uh, we have a kind of uh, 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 fundamental um, uh, and even leadership role in architectural education in this country. But that doesn't necessarily mean we, uh, uh, we stick with how architecture was taught in the 1860s. Um, it means actually quite the reverse. We're often trying to think uh, about how architecture needs to continue to change and to continue to advance to meet the challenges of the present day. Our gr deep grounding in the profession and the history of professional education has a kind of uh, mirror um, uh, here at MIT, which pulls us forward into the future, which is the nature of MIT as a research institution, as indeed the preeminent research institution in the world. The uh, nature of MIT as a, as a research institution is actually relatively recent. Um, uh, MIT was a trade school founded on the other side of the river in the 1860s, training people in the new um, mechanical um, uh, 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 disciplines of the Industrial Revolution here in the, in the Northeast. But during the Second World War, um, uh, particularly through the invention um, of, of radar and its development uh, here at MIT as part of the sec uh, World War II ef effort, uh, MIT vastly expanded its scale, its financial structures, and its commitment to uh, research. Initially, for the first 30 or 40 years after the Second World War, funded uh, almost entirely by the federal government, and then um, uh, uh, after that by foundations, um, uh, other kinds of grants, uh, industry partnerships, and all the rest. And that's the kind of MIT you know today, of a kind of startup economy, of a kind of entrepreneurial advances in technology. It's also not um, uh, uh, coincidental that MIT is home to key um, uh, architectural and manufacturing technologies, like the CNC machine, which is invented here, CAD, which is invented here, early experiments in prefabrication and housing, um, uh, early experiments in the relationship between software and flexible environments. And I'm just going to have the next group of slides go quickly through the work of our faculty, um, uh, uh, Skylar Tibbetts, Brandon Clifford, Rafi Siegel, um, Anton Garcia Abril, 
This is LCAU Research Center, Miho Mazarev's work on climate change, Caitlin Mueller, Azra Akshamia, uh, Yolande Daniels, Javi uh, uh, Aguirre, um, uh, Carrie Norman, and um, many other works of faculty uh, in uh, different kinds of books, journals, publications, uh, and, and exhibits. All our faculty today, and MIT is really comprised of its faculty. We have some of the have the lowest proportion of uh, of non faculty instructors of any uh, 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 of our com competing architecture schools. Every single faculty member you see here today is not just here to teach; is here to push forward the boundaries of the discipline. And so MIT has one foot in the profession and one foot in, um, uh, uh, in research about the future, and it's facing squarely towards the future of how these two things come together to shape the world. Oh, I missed one slide. Um, uh, a couple more slides here. Uh, this was a, a, a nice example of, uh, of how all of these th things came together uh, two years, uh, three years ago, the Venice Biennale of Architecture, for, um, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, one of the key events in the, in the architectural calendar of the year was curated by our dean and had more than 20 faculty in it. Um, uh, and our, our uh, design faculty uh, appear um, uh, in many places at the, um, at the edge of the discipline as well. So <clears throat> with that as a kind of um, uh, background to the deep history of the school, I want to give you a little picture of where we are uh, today. Um, the MIT is doing well in terms of its reputation. Um, uh, there is uh, only one uh, international ranking of the reputation of architectural schools, the Quattricelli Simmons Academic Survey. And we don't place a lot of stock in such things, but we do note that we've been um, first or second in this survey since it start, started in 2015. So we're pretty confident that we're doing well as far as other people perceive us. Um, I, I'm particularly happy with this slide. I, I showed you the big uh, uh, Biennale in 2021 with a lot of our faculty. Uh, I want to put it to you that actually um, uh, these are slides from the 2023 Venice Biennale. I think uh, to the extent that the Biennale may be relevant to the uh, considering an architectural school, you might want not to consider um, uh, the success of its faculty in being exhibitors, but maybe the success of its students. Um, uh, and in the 2023 uh, Architecture Biennale, uh, we had uh, uh, several of our students curating national pavilions, um, featured in exhibits, uh, and this is the, an example not just of the, of the remarkable people that you'll be in school with, but I would say in each of these cases, it was also uh, an example of mentorship and partnership with faculty to try to push forward the uh, agendas and ambitions of, their, of our students in every measure of their own careers and creative exploits. And that is uh, a commitment that we make to our students, and that is something that um, I would look forward to doing to all of you here. Um, another, uh, um, in the realm of professional education, um, uh, this is very kind of wonky, but um, uh, architecture programs are accredited by, accredited by the National um, uh, Architecture Accreditation Board, um, or NAB. Uh, last year, MIT went through this whole accreditation process. We were only, only five out of 36 programs reviewed in the last accreditation cycle to receive a full continuing accreditation without any, um, uh, what's called a plan to correct, but basically, they think we're teaching professional architecture as it should be taught uh, here at MIT with no, um, with no issues. Not only that, um, uh, the visiting team called out four criteria for accreditation that were met with distinction here at MIT. Um, first of all, our capacity for research and innovation, which one might expect, but I'm particularly proud of the other three um, uh, criteria we met with distinction, which is our learning and teaching culture, our commitment to human resources and human resource development amongst our staff, and our work in social equity, diversity, and inclusion. So with that, I would say that what we think about here at MIT, um, we could spend a lot of time being self-satisfied at our, at our reputation, but I think, um, uh, uh, and at the resources we're able to commit to our students in this education, but I would say, Almost every student and, and every faculty member you'll meet today is instead committed to the reverse, which is to say to not look um, sideways to our peers or to, um, uh, uh, to kind of uh, uh, expect the privilege that we, are, uh, that we have here in terms of both resources and access to them um, as a kind of, uh, uh, as our due or something we deserve, but rather um, uh, almost every student and faculty member you'll meet today uh, uh, instead looks at the world with a sense of urgency. 
um, uh, looks at a set of, of enormous uh, challenges that we face in which architecture is a key uh, uh, player, for better or for worse, and looks at how we can best shape ourselves not to compete with other architectural schools or to um, you know, have uh, uh, 19 Biennale exhibits in a given year instead of 17, but rather to transform the world uh, using the levers we are very fortunate to have here um, at MIT. And so um, a, a brief introduction to the kinds of questions we're asking here now. Uh, we framed them for the last couple of years uh, uh, under the following uh, um, uh, categories or rubrics. One is thinking deeply about the climate crisis and architecture's role in it. The other is thinking about equity and particularly about equity within the architectural profession and our role in advancing it. And second, uh, and, and finally, um, thinking about design and uh, design um, uh, as, a, as a kind of mode of thinking and making and doing that has deep instrumentality, not just for architects, uh, but for every profession, um, uh, uh, particularly as we face um, uh, the challenges of the climate crisis and need to continually adapt and remake and revise how we work and who we are as a society. So to briefly take you through these, um, uh, in the realm of climate, uh, I don't need to tell you there's a big problem. <laughs> um, I think all of you know that. We can see its effects throughout um, uh, uh, the physical world and throughout all the other uh, uh, social and cultural displacements that the climate crisis drives. But you may not know if you're relatively new to architecture or you may be well acquainted with the fact that architecture and uh, the construction and operation of buildings plays a pivotal role in the production of, um, uh, of greenhouse gases responsible for between 38 and 41% um, of, the, uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions depending on which metric you use. And of course, architecture is also at the front lines of the effects of the climate crisis on um, uh, chiefly on uh, our physical environment. So this is a nice graphic that a faculty member put together um, uh, a couple of years ago of all the ways all of our faculty are already working in the area of climate. And this was um, uh, uh, this survey happened previous uh, happened uh, at the at the outset of uh, of really trying to rethink how not only can we all work individually towards uh, addressing the challenges of the climate crisis, but also how can we uh, instrumentally work together. And we were really de uh, delighted when our new president here at MIT, Sally Kornbluth, made climate the center of her inauguration speech and the uh, center of a 10-year plan for her administration. And I particularly like this last quote, what could we do that would really move the needle and break the dial? Um, uh, and that's really what we're devoted to here um, uh, at MIT and in the department. So I'll feature a few uh, projects that have uh, happened with the, the uh, after the, the, the kind of onset of this dedicated effort around climate in the last couple of years, um, I'll call out uh, uh, Christoph, um, uh, uh, who is leading an effort to work together with building technology educators across the country to revise and remake how we teach building and engineering to better suit the climate crisis. I'll feature uh, uh, Caitlin Mueller and Sheila, Sheila Kennedy, who um, uh, uh, are, have started an instrumental set of research studios, uh, which we aim to expand, uh, climate research studios over the course of the uh, three-year cycle, looking at uh, reuse um, and um, uh, remaking of materials. Uh, this project's called Odds and Mods. Here's a beginning of a workshop um, that looks at actually how um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence can help us um, uh, use odd parts and odd bits of buildings that are left over to uh, remake and reconceive new kinds of design. We worked at the level of service, uh, initiating a project around a, a climate core here at MIT, which now um, uh, has become part of the larger climate project at MIT that, the, um, uh, that our new president has advanced. And this really relates to the next point, um, uh, which is how we think about um, uh, equity in the department. Uh, and how do we honor our legacy uh, in building a diverse profession? I say legacy because uh, this is another sepia-tinged uh, photo of MIT's history. And uh, in the back row here, uh, you see uh, an architect named Robert Robinson Taylor, who was not only MIT's first black graduate, but the first black architect uh, accredited in the United States in 1892. And um, uh, uh, Robert Taylor left MIT and went to um, uh, two years later to the campus of Tuskegee, uh, then the Tuskegee Institute, modeled on MIT in Alabama, where he built 48 uh, uh, buildings of the campus working with students. Uh, 
eight of which were uh, burned down um, uh, uh, in acts of, uh, of aggression uh, by the local population, but 40 of which um, uh, still stand. Uh, so we've started something uh, over the last th uh, three or four years called the Robert Taylor Project, where uh, we exchange um, uh, students and faculty between Tuskegee um, uh, uh, and MIT, looking at the architectural legacy of Robert Taylor, here at MIT students surveying the campus last year, and also bringing um, uh, students from Tuskegee here to uh, uh, MIT, in this case, looking at Robert Taylor's thesis um, uh, uh, in the MIT Museum and Library to work on uh, together on projects around uh, digital fabrication and entrepreneurship. Um, and this is a, uh, uh, an, an exchange and a partnership that we only expect to grow over the next several years. Uh, Lastly, I would uh, point to the, the uh, new landscape that awaits you coming to MIT uh, in terms of design and in terms of architecture's collaborations um, uh, to, uh, uh, to bring thinking and work around design across the MIT campus. Uh, we're really trying to think about how uh, the history of design at MIT can shape the future in the same way um, that we regularly do in the architecture department as well. Um, here I'd like to show a letter from um, William Ware. Uh, you don't know who William Ware is, but I'm about to tell you. He was the founder of this department. Uh, and this department only happened at MIT. It's the fourth department at MIT. And it was added at the last minute as the result of this letter, um, uh, which uh, William Ware wrote to the, uh, uh, the secretary of, of the nascent MIT in the 1860s. Um, and he first you know, declares that there's no adequate instruction in design in the country. Uh, and then he lists all the many um, uh, things that people are going to be learning at MIT, and then uh, maintains that no course of study other than design can better bring those things together. And so we uh, uh, find ourselves both then as now with a particular responsibility to the world and also a responsibility to MIT. Uh, to think about design and its transformative power. In this, we have a new and um, uh, uh, quite astonishing partner in the Morningside Academy for Design, which will be our kind of um, uh, roommate in our new home, which I'm about to show you and which some of you will see today. Um, uh, and we have a kind of deep collaboration both in undergraduate design education, but also in um, uh, uh, spreading and thinking about the power of design across the MIT campus. And uh, the, the tool to do that will be a new hub for design for MIT, which <clears throat> again, many of you will see in person later today, but um, uh, this is the former Metropolitan Storage Warehouse uh, built before MIT uh, existed here on the Cambridge side of the river. In fact, it was the edge of the river um, uh, when, it was, uh, when it was first uh, built. Um, uh, and these are the, all the spaces, uh, a studio, an auditorium, um, uh, the exterior, uh, windows to, to faculty offices that we get to decide what they become and decide how to fill with, uh, uh, with this mission, which I've outlined to you today, but also which I would invite you to come here to MIT and help shape. Um, I'll end again with a quote from um, uh, William Ware, uh, uh, which uh, it certainly continues to guide our efforts, which is that the aim of this school to do what it can in its day and generation to ensure that the architecture of the future shall be worthy of the future. I don't think that uh, statement has ever been more apt than in the current moment. Um, and I would, uh, again, invite you to come here and um, figure it out with us. So I'll stop there and uh, open up to any questions you have uh, in the next couple of minutes before we have our next presentation. Thank you so much. I can't believe I've answered every possible question you might have about MIT. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, larger design buildings that's a very good question. Um, as any of you who've already or, or already worked in architecture know, um, construction dates are um, uh, complex and slippy. Um, uh, the uh, what they tell us is uh, late twenty twenty five early 2026, the other, um, uh, they're really working at it, you'll see, uh, but it's a very complicated project, especially with the, uh, as an adaptive reuse project. We're quite proud that it's an adaptive reuse project. That's kind of the way things need to go generally, um, but uh, that also makes the construction process much more complex. But I can say uh, uh, with great um, certainty that if you come here, particularly for the MARC program, 
you'll be moving into this building and uh, it's uh, highly likely you'll be moving into this building in the SMARCS program as well. And if you're a PhD uh, student, you won't be able to remember a time where you weren't in this building. Do you have a question? Just raise your hand so I can get you the mic so that our friends joining us online can also hear your questions. I mean, I will, um, let me also say that in my presentation, I've focused on the things that you won't get in the other presentation, which is a broad overview. We do, um, we have a uh, fabulous and intensive uh, uh, design program in which many, many beautiful things were made, which you'll see in the next presentation, I think. We have a kind of deep um, uh, and intensive um, mentored research program in the SMARCS program, which uh, also you'll see many of the products of, and then um, you know the the different um, several different PhD programs in the department also provide a kind of uh, uh, long-standing foundational kind of culture of research which impacts all these things as well. So as you go through the rest of the day, you'll encounter those other portions of, of what we do and, and think about how they supplement this larger conversation here. All right. Well, I've either dumbfounded you or you haven't had enough coffee yet, um, uh, and I expect probably the latter. Um, but with that, I will give um, the podium over to my colleague, Liam O'Brien, to talk about our MR program. Great. Okay. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to MIT Architecture. Um, as Nicholas mentioned, uh, I'm William O'Brien, Jr. I'm uh, the director of the MR program. Um, and please allow me to be the next in line to congratulate all of you who are here. Um, if you're here, it means the uh, committee was really taken by your work um, and was really impressed by your desire to want to be part of the community here. Um, of the approximately 600 applicants, uh, we're only able to admit just a small fraction. Um, so uh, we are super excited to spend time with you today to see if uh, this is indeed the right place for you. Um, so while Nicholas provided a, uh, a broader sort of historical and cultural context that helps to situate the department and our program offerings, I'm gonna uh, be a bit finer grained and uh, share aspects of our MARC program that are central to it and that differ differentiate it from other MARC programs. Um, and in this session, we'll also hear from 10 other faculty and instructors uh, to help flesh out this fuller picture of what MIT has to offer and what makes our curriculum unique. Um, the MARC program is a studio-centric professional program. Uh, ours is different than others in a number of important ways. Um, firstly, uh, our context is, is very different than other programs. Um, the context within which the MARC program is run is uh, influenced to a pretty significant degree, um, as Nicholas has mentioned, um, by its situation within the leading research institute. And it's comprised of six schools and a college. Um, and our own department of architecture sits adjacent to five other departments and centers, as well as an academy for design. Uh, the department of architecture itself, uh, the groups on the left, um, are, is constituted by six discipline groups, each of which represents the deepest and most progressive research in their respective subfields through faculty work and through the laboratories and professional practices uh, of those faculty. So it's an important distinction from other MARC programs that our, our, that our program operates within and across these discipline groups, which enables our students to essentially uh, stitch together new and original ways of thinking about the discipline and profession of architecture that draw from these deep wells of scholarship and practice. Uh, the shape of our program could look like this. Um, given the studio centricity of the program, one way that we think about the path of our program is through architectural design cycles. Broadly speaking, the pedagogical underpinning to our studio sequence considers the sequential acts of architectural design throughout the curriculum to be increasingly complex layered and challenging with uh, more structure and guidance in the core portion, which I'll talk more about, um, and more openness and independence in the option studio part of the program. And then really um, 
a lot of relative autonomy with guidance from an advisor in the thesis portion of one's experience in the program. Um, unlike many other MR programs, we have condensed the core portion of our curriculum to the first three semesters. And we've honed our core sequence to be both more dense and compact as a result of all of our efforts um, and, and resources that we contribute to refining the core sequence. And we do this uh, both because we think we can uh, uh, really make that uh, first three semesters very robust and, and thick and rich, but we also do it um, in order to expand the option studio uh, part of the program. Our core studios, as was uh, referenced by Nicholas, um, are taught by a, a very high percentage of tenured tenure track and senior long-term instructors. And this provides a really important center of gravity uh, to the core sequence that uh, really anchors the program, establishing culture through the values demonstrated in courses early on in one's time with the program. Option studios, for those uh, who are unfamiliar, are a curated set of advanced studios that represent timely questions in the discipline and the profession taught by our own world-renowned faculty uh, and select outside practitioners and researchers whose voices we, as a community, and students are involved in this, find progressive and important to bring here. Here at MIT, our students experience three option studios in their fourth, fifth, and sixth semesters. And what this means is they have three opportunities to rehearse different value sets and motivations for practicing architecture. It means three opportunities to dial in one's own interests through the navigation of differently oriented studios. And it also means potential uh, more travel uh, opportunities to understand how architectural challenges are different or similar depending on distinct cultural contexts. Our program ends with a year long thesis. And we see the thesis both as a kind of culmination to your body of work, as well as, and perhaps even more importantly, as a hinge moment into your career. This opportunity to develop what we call uh, a studio pedagogy for one, in order to make a contribution to the discipline, allows students a full year to reflect on what they've done here at MIT and how they might leverage it as a launching pad into progressive forms of professional practice, uh, academic posts, research opportunities, or perhaps roles in industry. Our students' uh, trajectories post MIT are, as you can probably imagine, highly varied. Um, and include becoming licensed and being influential practitioners in established offices, beginning their own architectural design offices, uh, non-traditional forms of practice that are reflective of the entrepreneurial environment here at MIT, uh, being active through various forms of scholarship. Um, and as you'll see later in this session, uh, the thesis itself here at MIT takes on many modalities and has outputs of many formats inclusive of both architectural design and research. Uh, as I mentioned, I've invited, uh, um, excuse me, I've invited faculty and instructor who have critical roles in the core sequence, as, those, uh, as well as those teaching in option studios and running theses to help us flesh out the uh, curricular framework by sharing work from the courses they run. Um, so I, I would just ask faculty presenters to come forward when their portion of the presentation comes up in sequence. As I happen to coordinate core one studio, I'm gonna kick off the presentations. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit more from me. Um, our Core One studio uh, was recently taught by Carrie Norman, Mohammed Nala, who you'll hear from later, and me. Um, this is a critical course within the larger context of the whole curriculum, um, but also a, a really critical course within the first semester. We, uh, as a faculty, will really as a community, uh, understand this incredible transition that you're making. Uh, for many of you, it's a new city, some of you a new country, um, and all of you uh, a new professional program. So this studio is in large part about various forms and scales of orientation. You don't have to read all these now, you'll become familiar with these uh, should you join us in the fall. Um, but we, uh, as, a, as a teaching team, recognize that Core One Studio has many responsibilities uh, to introduce you to the culture of the studio, as a place to make work, to introduce you to good and healthy work habits, among many other. To that end, our studio culture aspires to be about being present, about being together, conjuring uh, your unique cohort identity. We believe that studio uh, culture is absolutely critical, um, and 
uh, one testament to this is that we supply you with workstations um, and that those will allow you to uh, access all of the technology and all of the, the software that you need. This provides us a kind of fluidity between the intellectual aspects of the course and the uh, technique oriented aspects of the exercises. Our core one studio is concerned with discovering what is at the foundation of architectural thinking and making today. Um, so the core one studio, like many of our studios are, are always evolving, uh, kind of reflective of uh, the con contemporaneous moment. We have in the recent past been working across three increasingly complex design exercises, each of which have a dual role of both providing opportunities to address pedagogical objectives important to the course, such as rehearsing modes of representation, working with ordering systems, uh, conceptual understandings of assembly and part to whole relationships, experimenting with new forms of making, while the exercises also have a role of introducing new students to ever expanding contexts uh, within which you are learning. So we use the exercises to orient you within the department, within the school, within the institute, um, and then uh, within our city. Themes act as anchors around which questions of representation, um, uh, such as conceptual thinking um, and physical making can orbit. Uh, for, for example, themes in exercise one consider form, composition, circulation, narrative, ordering systems, among a few others. And these themes get tested in this particular exercise by way of the design of a representational object or an abstract model. A second exercises, uh, excuse me, a second exercise engages themes of social gathering, forms of collectivism and individualism through the design of a room or more specifically a hall. This hall engages a highly charged site here on campus um, that sits at the interface between the department and the institute, both conceptually and culturally and actually spatially. Um, students are prompted to engage with the culture and uh, political dynamics at play and identify formal, material, spatial, and tectonic, otherwise architectural manifestations of these relationship. Agency is a term um, that we are, are talking a lot about in, in Core One. And we, we look to test out agency through architectural means, um, uh, uh, tangible architectural means. And a third and final exercise of Core One Studio um, engages themes such as archiving and display, institutional identity, more specifically reconsidering the department's historical and cultural identity through the design of an archive that must negotiate with the complex contents, contexts of MIT and the surrounding urban conditions. Um, as I mentioned, contexts become increasingly layered uh, throughout the, the sequence of the exercises and um, it's the, the context here is extremely rich in this final exercises and, and students are asked to consider things um, consider things as they exist through intense observation, uh, through deep and empathetic analyses in order to draw out new forms of the known. This relationship between that which is found and that which is invented is a really important layer of consideration that anticipates conversations about adaptive reuse and preservation. Um, the physical and spatial complexity of the site of exercise three is such that students are actively thinking about their intervention as intervention both a part of a larger fabric with necessary negotiations with the existing ordering systems, as well as a discrete entity that expresses itself uniquely as an institution in its own right. Um, the core one studio is considered really as one chunk of a larger curated core one experience. Um, and in order to uh, help us understand other aspects of the core one experience, you'll hear from um, Jay, JG, uh, Christoph Reinhardt, and uh, Anna Miliachki. So uh, at this point, I'd love to invite Jay up to talk about cultures of form. Hi everyone, I'm Jay Rock G, and I teach a course called Cultures of Form that you'll all hopefully be taking in um, the fall. Uh, cultures of Form really sort of takes form, architectural form specifically, and um, tries to immerse you within the various, what I consider to be cultural conversations that um, surround sort of the refinement, the production, the invention, and the various qualities of form that architects sort of um, 
let's say, uh, learn and deploy. Um, the semester is sort of split into three parts, and it's very actively trying to take what are formerly, let's say, canonical architectural conversations that weren't considered perhaps a subculture and arraying them next to other sort of cultural determinants or contexts. So we look at aesthetic categories. We look at many things. Uh, overall, the semester is split up into, into thirds. The first portion is what I call immerse. The month of September, really, we look at seeing or biases and representation. We look at forming biases and curvature and rationalization, biases and construction, perhaps, and try to take a broad view, both geographically and historically. So in seeing, for instance, we look at, as an example, um, let's say, an analysis of Chinese landscape painting practice and how time and space are understood in that in relation to more Western practices. Um, and similarly, we'll go through some of these other, very other contexts and other processes that I won't get into just now because it's a little too in the weeds. Um, part two, rehearse, um, sort of like we look at various, we rehearse various perhaps techniques um, and tools that should be should become familiar to you as architects. We look at developability, uh, so we look at carving, weaving, folding, panelizing. We try to cast a very wide net um, so that you as a cohort can encounter a much more diverse and broad ranging set of, let's say, um, rehearsals as to how one develops and refines form. And then in part three, we sort of, um, shift over to making, so it's a very open-ended part of the semester where um, you're encouraged to develop your own very particular, let's say, interaction between a culture of form and an object series that is also intended to acquaint you with some of the sort of tools and departments and, let's say, uh, infrastructure of MIT that you should hopefully take advantage of that ranges from the Mars lab where you can cast bismuth or sort of other things. This is a very beautiful um, object by Pearl Wilmer Childs um, that is sort of looking at weaving um, and sort of producing a, um, let's say a circular, uh, conceptually circular object similar to a Mobius strip. Um, this is a beautiful series last year by, or no, two years ago, I believe, by Mara. Um, Mara was looking at grain as an example, looking at sort of checkerboarded sort of uh, wood masses and sort of slicing through them in different ways to, re to sort of really demonstrate how grain is revealed uh, within architecture. Mateo went full on robot and <laughs> <laughs> made an object that breathes very beautifully. It was called Searching for Breath. And so we encouraged Matteo in his interests and you know, he became really interested in Arduino, in programming, in sort of casting soft surfaces. Um, Carolyn years ago was interested in uh, producing an object that could be made with only one panel type. So it's just one curvy trapezoid that sort of is rotated around and becomes this entire complex object. Um, down to more, let's say, culturally or, or normatively understood, uh, culturally oriented conversations, Evan Ortiz was interested in, let's say, how we read typology in structure and how things that appear to be oriented one way may become quite ambiguous through subtle things like color, texture, proportion, and perceived age to produce a very unfamiliar object. Um, Ose years ago made this beautiful thing. Um, Ose was very interested in um, curved folding and made this, and also just really loved Alexander McQueen. So this is like a iridescent spring steel sort of object that's stitched and riveted together. Um, so really the course is a bit of a, in some ways an excuse for you to um, or a platform, let's call it, that's a more charitable word, and a platform for you to explore, to dive into a specific interest, to perhaps get a taste of what um, design research can look like at an object scale, to sort of begin to get into that, let's say, mentality, um, and to understand how a series can develop, um, which I do think is 
very important for you. Um, hopefully the, the, the course can function a little bit like a Rorschach for you to sort of hit the ground with um, acts of, of making and immersion. Um, and the intention is not for everyone to learn everything, but to sort of lay out the field in front of you and for you to sort of land somewhere. And then also as you as a cohort, then to be collectively situated um, amongst yourselves, but also amongst what I would consider to be a, a very exciting moment in architectural discourse and in terms of what we call canon or what we call let's say, um, the formative and sort of essential forms of architectural knowledge. OK. Thank you. Oh, more pretty things. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to MIT. Uh, my name is Christoph Reinhardt, and I'm going to introduce the Environmental Technologies in Buildings class. This is actually one of three classes similar as we have Core 1, 2, and 3. We have BT 1, 2, and 3 taught by my colleagues uh, John Oxendorf, Caitlin Miller, and myself. So obviously, a key requirement is that you have a Germanic-sounding name uh, to teach this class. Um, I really... Uh, love this uh, class because on the one end it allows us to really go back to the fundamentals every year how do buildings function when we look at uh, climate driven design daylighting energy and just working with climate and on the other hand the class is really uh, constantly evolving by us exploring um, new modes of practice so how do we apply all these different uh, fundamentals that we've been knowing about for many years but help you to implement them directly into their design. And we are doing this by this uh, nine-step workflow. This is called netzerobuildings.mit.edu, where you are basically learning throughout the duration of the class to design a net zero building. And on the one hand, we are testing these workflows with you. And on the other hand, we are working with uh, 15, some of the largest architecture firms in the world to see whether these methods work in practice as well. So there's a very clear relationship and whatever you're learning here, you can apply right away. And I would say very often if students are interested, that helps them also to get internships uh, in the following summers if they want to uh, practice. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing some student work, I should have copied more into that. Uh, you find that on this website, again, that's uh, netzerobuildings.mit.edu. As Nicholas said, we are trying to basically broaden that knowledge and learn from others how they're teaching building science. So we're working right now with about 20 schools of architectures across the country to basically fine tune these exercises more and more that, that they're engaging students. Um, one of the backbones that we're using here, as I said, we're using simulations throughout uh, the school. Everybody is using uh, Rhino. Uh, we are particularly using a plugin called Climate Studio that goes along uh, with Rhino. So if you're thinking about getting a computer, it would be great if it's Windows compatible because uh, the plugin only works uh, under Windows. And just to give you a little bit of a flavor, so I said, I talked about fundamentals. So on the one hand side, we are looking really at if you're anywhere on Earth, how do you determine where the sun is located with respect to uh, where you are. And it's really surprising how actually easy that is. So you're, in a way, you could even program that in a little Excel spreadsheet, and it would empower you to start your solar architecture right out of Excel. We're using more advanced tools, but once we are covering the fundamentals, we're basically showing you how you can apply that architecturally, be it through shading studies or photovoltaic analysis that tells you how much electricity you could be generating. And I'm a big fan of basically not only modeling something, but you testing your model and see how this tests with respect to reality. So one of the first uh, exercises that we also do is that you are creating an object, you're putting it in the sun and you're taking a photograph, and then you're doing a like two second simulation. And obviously nature is right, so that's a way for you to fine tune yourself and see if you can reproduce basically the shadows. And if you can do that here at different times in the year, you can do that anywhere. And we are following the same spirit throughout that basically you're not just designing in a computer, but you always have an, an idea of what all of this means in reality. 
And then finally, I'm not a big fan uh, of exams. I think I've never given an exam. Uh, and so instead, uh, to just see in how far what you are learning you can actually apply in design, we are playing the simulation game. On the right-hand side, you see a group of students a couple of years ago. Basically, the idea is you're going to compete in 90 minutes who, within a certain budget, designs the most energy-efficient building they can. Aesthetics are out the window. You learn that in the other classes. It's all about money and carbon. So that's a really fun exercise. And of course, it acts as a, not as a prop uh, for the values I want to give you, but just uh, shows you, like everything else, if you take it to an extreme, you see what kind of buildings evolve. And then you can take that knowledge and combine it with your aesthetics to find better solution overall. So really excited uh, to have some of you in class in the fall. And if you have any questions, please uh, see me afterwards. Thanks. Hello, everyone. You awake? Excited? All right. So I'm Anna Milacki, uh, currently in disguise uh, as the, or with wearing the hat of uh, history theory professor for MRC's first year. I want to congratulate all the MRCs and SMARCs to whom I will talk uh, in half an hour. Uh, on different topics, but what I want to tell you about is the first history theory class that you uh, get to take in the first semester of uh, your MR. It is organized and uh, aligned with various things that you're doing in other classes. Uh, its key point is to um, actually socialize us intellectually as a group around topics that are current uh, and their immediate uh, History. So we will look at things that are happening right now that are really important topics that the discipline has taken on. And we will look at the lineage of some of those ideas uh, historically. So we will keep going across a kind of a temporal spectrum from 70s to 2024 uh, with texts that are uh, sometimes the year in which we are uh, learning. The key thing that you'll be doing, so basically nothing in that class will be understood or taught as canon, but you will be invited to discuss everything together. And the key thing that I like us to kind of, kind of produce by the end of it is that shared experience of discussing these topics together in a way in which uh, you can bring your own knowledge and baggage to bear upon architectural questions. What you're seeing here is the moment of uh, uh, interaction between the uh, positions class and studio. We uh, have been able to carve out a little space from the studio to meet with studio faculty and discuss topics that we are discussing anyway. Uh, every week in this class, you will be writing. So, and you will be getting better and better at writing. We try to help uh, with that basically as you go. But what this means is also that you arrive to classroom prepared and with ideas about uh, the topics that we read. Um, there are presentations and there is a final uh, event in which we discuss uh, something that we call visual dossiers, which is an attempt to intervene in architectural discourse uh, by means other than paper, though writing is part of it. Uh, but what we're imagining is that these are your interventions in architectural discourse that take shape uh, uh, of a possibly an illustrated article of uh, an opinion piece of uh, an obituary, if you want, of, uh, of a game. And then here you're seeing uh, one of these events where we are playing a game that's um, cards against sustainability based on cards against humanity, which you might know, or another kind of uh, project that was looking at architectural archetypes, uh, a critical, maybe uh, ironic take on what is available as a set of roles we might have in the discipline. Uh, or here, uh, a beta version of Hylenopoly, which was uh, a game produced in the final event for positions where students were studying gentrification processes around the High Line uh, and embodied the logics of the game Monopoly that you might know, uh, which we later produced, and I'll show you that for a second. And this was a game also called Tort. I don't know why, it's, it's like a 
this is a perennial kind of question at MIT, is our technology up to speed? But, uh, <laughs> but so this, uh, in this game, uh, students organized laws by which building was allowed or disallowed in different locations, locations and particular buildings. And the point of the game is that you make an argument, a legal argument for why a certain building should not be built. Um, and here is what sometimes happens with uh, items that we produce in the context of positions. Um, everything about positions is really operating under the umbrella and our framework, value framework uh, of the critical broadcasting lab that I run. So everything we make uh, in this context is also an intervention in discourse and meant as that. And, and uh, so the idea with some of these, this is the Hylenopoly now produced at a higher level, absolutely playable uh, with all of the kind of information that is in fact true information about the value of uh, buildings that have been built by various architects, star architects around the High Line. Uh, and we included it in uh, an exhibition that we called Playroom that had a series of different uh, games students had invented that semester in different uh, pedagogical frameworks that I uh, that I sponsor, and uh, we used each week of this exhibition to discuss one of these games and to play them across all of the tables so that they could become discussions in the school uh, and amongst all of us. So it's a super fun class. I really enjoy teaching it, and I hope you will too. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Cristina Parreño. I'm the coordinator of Core 2 Design Studio, uh, which I'm currently teaching with Rafi Siegel and Jaffer Kolb. Um, so Core 2 sits uh, really at the midpoint of the core program. And I would say that if in core we offer design methods uh, to begin to enter uh, or to find different entry points to the design process, um, core two does it through the lens of organization. So uh, we think organization as these three elements, organization of program, circulation, and structure. In the past uh, years, we have taken on the topic of the theater, which has been interesting because it sort of helps us uh, think these three elements uh, through a broader spectrum of temporalities, like uh, can we think program as a performance, for example, that takes place in different durations of time, or circulation, no? the theatricality of moving bodies and materials in a space and, and in the building and, and so on. And so the, the studio is not really to design a theater, but more so to intervene in an existing theater, in the Strand Theater in Dorchester. And this is important for two reasons. Uh, the first one is because it uh, situates us uh, in a scenario that is going to be more and more common, which is that we don't have a building site uh, that is an empty lot, uh, but rather that our site is an existing uh, structure that we intervene in uh, in the built environment. No? And this is something that we are going to have to deal uh, uh, more and more uh, in, in the future. And the other uh, reason uh, is that we have so much to learn from an existing uh, building, no? Like the Strand Theater is there, it's been there for a hundred years. Um, we go, we visit, uh, we study the construction documents. Um, and so there, there is like a lot to learn, like we talk with the building manager, there is a lot, there is a real thing, no? We, we learn a lot from something that exists. Um, the project is though not a, a project of adaptive reuse, the, the theater remains as a program and then there are different degrees of intervention or protection no, of, the, of the project. But what we do ask students is to develop interventions that transform program circulation and structure in order to make the theater more accessible. And we think uh, accessibility in terms of the city, accessibility in terms of the subjects who can access the theater, and then accessibility in terms of time. Of course, when we think access and accessibility, we, we also think ADA, we also think uh, the wheelchair, how can you move through the space? And some students 
uh, this one, for example, took it seriously or rather uh, uh, playfully. If you see to the left the existing Strand Theatre and to the right, uh, it's a bit uh, uh, light, but, but the work was uh, to reconfigure the internal structure of the building in order to make it uh, fully accessible for a wheelchair and in, in that process also reconfiguring the structure of the sitting and thinking the, the chair, no? like uh, studying the chair as that element that sort of makes the body accessible to the, to the uh, building, no? the, the, the chair as the connector of, the, of architecture and the body. Uh, other projects, for example, take on circulation, but from the perspective of materials, if you think uh, the building site, uh, const the construction of the, the building site for construction, uh, as something that is similar to the construction of the stage. Uh, maybe the, the temporalities have, are different, but it's, uh, uh, they sort of uh, are rooted in the same idea of movement of materialities and that in, immediately confront us with ideas of waste, ideas of uh, recycling, uh, ideas of material cycles. This project uh, or these students, Mara, Mara and uh, Charlie, designed a sort of workshop, um, a recycling machine that would work with these uh, uh, material movements uh, of architecture and of the theater itself. And so they were working with a circulation of materials, but at the same time, they were by adding a new program, they were making the theater more accessible at other times. No, when the theater was not being used as a theater, it was a uh, uh, a fab lab, no? It was a making a space. Um, then there are other uh, uh, approaches, like this one of Mateo. You've heard this student before, uh, or you're, you've seen another project of his before. Um, he was looking at access through the lens of the scale of the, or through the urban scale, thinking about the, how can we make the theater more accessible to the, to the city, no? So it's this idea of access, again, through the lens of, um, uh, I don't know, again, technology here. It's, again, uh, access through the lens of uh, the subject, through the lens of uh, time, and, and through the lens of um, uh, the city. Um, I'm going to stop here because actually you guys are coming to visit us in Core 2 at 2 p.m. And so you will have a chance to see what the students are up to and to talk to them, which is the, the real thing. Um, so welcome and, and again, congratulations from my side as well. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, Yolande Daniels, the coordinator of CORE 3. Uh, let's see, CORE 3 um, studio is a, it's basically a long span studio. Um, it's team taught. Um, the team has consisted of, an, in the last semester, Andrew Scott, um, JG, um, Adam Modisette, and myself. Um, we coordinate with the building technology um, classes, and that's coordinated by Caitlin Mueller. Um, students work on individual and team projects as well. So there's, there's kind of a team aspect to um, CORE 3, but students also have um, individual initiatives and individual projects. Um, carrying the team um, ethos further, we also have uh, a TA team that um, assists us. Um, the, the studio was based on three site ecologies um, in the last round. These were tidal, um, inclined, or boreal, that's B, and A is flat and residential. Um, and students could, uh, they had the option to explore one or more of the site um, and conditions. We work with uh, uh, partners. So um, in addition to you know, our teaching team, our TA team, we also reach out to um, community organizations and experts. Eastie Farm was one in East Boston, which is where our site was. Um, Tracy Chang at Pagu Restaurant, which is very close by here, was another partner. We had a round table with uh, people who are working in the food industry and dealing with food insecurity. Um, and then also we took a site visit to Grace Farms. 
So the studio is based on, um, well, it was based on a series of studies that were ways that, of looking at the building and the environment. Um, and through the idea of building typologies, but the typologies um, started at the smallest scale, kind of like a non-building scale to the building scale. So they went from lunchbox to um, a long span structure. Um, so these are building typologies, but they were also food storage containers. So each one was a way that students could look at humidity and control within a container of one scale or another. And this is the lunchbox review. Um, the second typology was the pantry typology. Each typology kind of built off the other. Each is leading to the final project in the end. Um, so we had a series of roundtables, reviews, workshops, pinups. Um, the long table was something we focused a lot on um, literally in the semester as a way to come together. So that's the pantry typology. In looking at these typologies, we started with um, uh, precedent studies of, of lunch boxes, of um, uh, uh, sorry, pantries and markets. And then the students um, developed through iterations studies of each. Each one of these was a building block toward the final project which was the long span structure, the long house. Students, again, they could choose whichever site they wanted to work on. This is a, a student um, who actually moved across all three sites. We work in large scale details, model making, drawings, renderings. Um, the studies can be in iterations we encourage them to be um, refined in their final execution, but, um, but we like to experiment to get there. So um, getting there can be messy um, and just can take lots of studies. We really emphasize thinking through making and communicating and experiencing through making and sharing together at multiple scales. On behalf of your core three teaching team, congratulations. I, we look forward to meeting you today and seeing you in the fall. Thank you. Excellent. Um, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here with you. My name is Caitlin Mueller, and this is my colleague, Sheila Kennedy. I'm a professor in the Building Technology Program, and Sheila is a professor in the Architecture and Urbanism Program. And it's pretty unusual for us to be up here together, but um, we're really thrilled to share a new initiative um, which takes the form of an options studio and some additional um, pedagogical offerings called Odds and Mods, which um, started this year. Um, so this is an options level studio for MARC students um, who have finished the first three core semesters. Um, our studio um, this semester is called Castaways. Um, the larger kind of organizational effort is called Odds and Mods. And this is sponsored by a new program called the Spoon Climate Initiative. So a lot of names. Um, and uh, we'll try to give you a, a hint at what we're working on because this will be continuing for the next few years. So hopefully some of you can participate in, as well. Um, so the, the studio is, is centered in the climate crisis and is looking at ways to approach new forms of architecture that embrace circularity and unusual or underutilized um, material sources. Um, in particular, every semester or every spring semester, we're going to focus on a different material source. So it's hyper-focused on individual monomaterial kinds of approaches to architecture. This semester, the first one we're focusing on brick, um, we're centered in the climate crisis. So as, as you probably know, the built environment, buildings, infrastructure, cities, are responsible for 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And a larger and larger percentage of that is due to building materials and construction processes. So extracting virgin material, transporting it to industrial plants, processing it, that's a huge source of emissions. Um, and all of this indicates to us that um, it's time that we look at alternatives. And in particular, as I said, we're, we're really interested in 
alternative sources of materials, and we're pursuing something called circularity. Circularity is the idea that instead of um, taking new materials from the earth, instead we we source materials from existing supply chains that are circular, so we salvage materials from existing buildings. We utilize what would otherwise be waste. That's what we're working on this semester. Um, and in that process, we're not only trying to sort of work on an economic argument or an argument just about numbers, but we're also looking at how that changes design and aesthetics. It's really a new approach to embrace the heterogene heterogeneous sort of um, array of materials we can find if we brought in our palette, but also um, a way to find new aesthetic potentials in the imperfection of waste. Um, so oh, this was just animating. So this is, um, this is a, a factory in Maine that we just went to that produces brick. Five to 15% of all brick produced in, in factories in the United States is actually waste. So it's just thrown away. There's no use for it. So that is the source of material for our studio this year. This is one of three brick factories we went to visit with students. Here we are learning more about brick production at the Morin Brick Factory. This was back in February when it was a little bit colder. Um, the sources of waste are um, really interesting for us. We really get into the details of what, why these materials are, are underutilized or, or thrown away. In this case, the production of brick um, has a very local source. So you, draw, you, you grab clay directly from the site very close to the factory, but then you use really high temperature kilns um, powered by natural gas to fire them into ceramic usable parts. The firing process produces all of this uneven coloring. Many of the pieces are, or some of the pieces cannot be used because of discoloration. There's also waste because of um, specialty pieces that are produced. Each one of these represents a mold for a different piece of brick architecture. There are over, overstock of all the elements that are not used and are then cast away into these piles at the site of the brick factory. So this is us learning more about these processes and then starting to think creatively and critically about what to do with them. So this is 3D scans or digital twins of waste brick that we encountered on our visits to these brick factories this semester. By digitizing the inventory, we can start to connect with emerging digital tools to think about what new design potentials we could explore and consider. So for here in this example from Dominique, for example, we take the Flemish bond, one of the really traditional um, bond patterns with, you know, th from brick throughout history, and think about how irregular pieces might be inserted to create new types of patterns which transmit light and create um, aesthetic effects in new ways. So really what we're trying to do is to think deeply about the consequences of using brick waste and excess brick. I know, will we have a super thick architecture with walls? Is it a kind of a new entree into pocket space or poche? What will be the aesthetics? What will be the ethos? And how could this shift or change um, the discipline of architecture. Um, so uh, for the first problem, students uh, took on a local site and then they worked more globally. We looked at market precedents, we looked at the local brick, and the students designed cooking stations for slow cooking in a market in Somerville. And just to show you, this is uh, Evan's work. Um, he was imagining um, a suspended chunk of brick waste, which would be ballast for a lightweight tensile roof that would cover his market. Um, Mac was looking at a super chunky wall, um, which was agnostic to whatever brick he could put in. So he had these different piles that you see here of, of different, different brick, and he could use any one of those to create um, the form of his um, market. Mara was interested in kind of exposing um, the differences in size. So she has one regular and one highly irregular side that was incredibly lumpy and kind of textural, a super texture, if you will. Uh, Bernardo was interested in site cast cisterns that could be constructed in the ground and then uh, lifted up into his market. And Manavi um, was interested in um, uh, structures that had a kind of a lattice effect with the waste brick. And I'm showing you um, a sampling of second year and third year students. Um, and so the second year students would be you, um, just a scant um, two years from now um, if you come and join us. So um, Caitlin and I are, are trying to kind of put forward, and I'll, I'll be super quick about this, an idea about how research, academic research, can, um, can have an impact outside of academia. And we call this radical plausibility. So we just returned from a trip to Mexico where students encountered matters of concern that are quite real and are trying to um, imagine radically different futures that could address those concerns. 
Um, so we went to the south edge of Mexico City in an, an area called Xochimilco, which was part of the uh, ancient Aztec city and has been completely hemmed in now by the giant mega city that is Mexico City. And there are a series of uh, traditional farms that we had a chance to visit, speaking with farmers who are carrying forward um, highly productive methods that are under threat of Nahuatl uh, farming, uh, food production and cooking. Um, we met with members of the community and talked about um, water scarcity, about the need to collect water, about the need to maintain and actually defend this territory and the culinary practices that go into it. We learned a lot about the kind of continuation to this day of pre-Hispanic ingredients and also cooking. And yes, of course, we did sample um, some of that cooking um, as we were invited into the homes of Nahuatl cooks who explained their oven system, brick oven system, uh, cooking and traditional uh, means of, um, of preparing food. Uh, we also had a chance to see traditional brick uh, architecture here. Mauricio Rocha, uh, an architect of the Studio Iturbide, uh, took us on a wonderful tour of this entirely bricky brick building. Um, and we also visited brick factories in Mexico. Spoiler alert, um, there's a lot of waste in Mexico as well. Uh, waste on the left, artisanal brick making and industrial brick making. Um, and we were able to kind of um, scan um, that brick, digitally take the twins back, and um, we're working on that now, how to support um, these traditional means of cooking um, using the waste brick. So we're really looking forward to see you. Um, we'll talk with you later at lunch and beyond if you're interested. Um, and that's Odds and Mods. Please join us. Good morning, everyone. So welcome to MIT Architecture. My name is Mohamed Nahli. I am a lecturer in architecture and urbanism. And I'm delighted to offer you a glimpse uh, of the Option Studio uh, I'm teaching this semester in partnership with the Al Khan program for uh, Islamic architecture. So in the Umayyad route, uh, our focus has been on a collection of desert castles, um, either built or modified by the Umayyad Empire. Um, the first major Muslim dynasty in the seventh century um, and specifically, we've been looking into a cluster of eight castles, which you can see in red here, uh, located in present-day Jordan. So these castles, uh, known as Qusur in Arabic, are connected today by a multi-lane highway that has effectively severed them from the broader history of the Arabian desert. Um, while no one really knows exactly why these castles were built in the first place, um, scholars have put forward um, several theories regarding their possible functions. So some have argued that they served as hedonistic retreats for the Umayyad aristocracy. Um, others suggest that the Qusur operated as way stations between Syria and Arabia, um, or as fortified residential settlements, um, as extensions of pre-Islamic buildings, as temporary residences to control tribes in the Arabian desert, or even as prosperous commercial and economic enterprises. So in the first part of the studio, our aim was to really integrate design research into those different historical theories. Um, and to do so, we initiated our own architectural competition, wherein each student took on one of the different theories and spent the first month really trying to adapt it, exist in it, believe in it, and make others also believe in it. Um, and so the objective was really for the students to um, defend this theory uh, through architectural research methodologies, be it in terms of model making, cartography, mapping, and so on and so forth. So the objective was really to construct a compelling argument, um, a compelling spatial argument, right, as to why their theory holds more weight than the others. So this really wasn't a competition to demonstrate um, the most accurate historical theory, but rather an opportunity for students to um, showcase their ability to advocate for uh, different speculations through um, architecture, using, for instance, um, orthographic projection, um, mapping and simulation, um, layering and accumulation, um, subjective and ocular dis distortions, um, cosmic and territorial calculations. 
Um, alongside an analytical models such as this one, uh, designed for navigating the castles under the Jordanian night sky, um, over spring break, we were able to actually witness that sky firsthand um, as we embarked on a week-long trip to Jordan, engaging with curators, historians, material experts, and students at the University of Petra, um, all actively involved in studying desert heritage. Um, and while we allowed ourselves to consume the not-so-occasional snack, uh, we remain dedicated to embracing uh, the joys of Ramadan and breaking fast together. Um, our first uninterrupted uh, five nights in Jordan felt like a con continuous expedition, uh, starting with the Amman Citadel um, and the Umayyad Palace Complex. From there, we ventured to the desert castles, beginning with Qasr al Mshatta, which you can see here, where, uh, nice, where a pile of bricks reminded us of castaways. <laughs> um, next, we proceeded to Qasr Kharana, uh, the most complete of the castles. Um, more details here. Then we went to Qusair Amra, the bathhouse, with the oldest depiction of the night sky on a dome ever recorded, um, amongst other incredible frescoes. Uh, next, we visited Al Azraq Castle, uh, known for its arches of black basalt, before finally heading to Qasr al Hallabat, uh, famous for its extensive um, irrigation systems, canals, aqueducts, and mosaics. Uh, of course, we couldn't pass up the chance to conclude um, our journey in the active desert. Uh, without floating in the Dead Sea. Um, from there, we pressed forward towards Petra and ultimately completed our adventure in Wadi Ram. And so today in studio, literally today, like in a few hours, uh, our goal is to finalize the process of integrating the various theories, um, drawing from our observations in Jordan, um, and examining really how conflicting claims can converge and evolve. Um, this is really important because those intersections uh, will launch our third and primary phase of the studio, where we will expand upon our designs for the castle's past to imagine alternative futures for the castles. Um, so this is something that we hope to, have to do by advocating for the inc increased involvement, I guess, of the castles in not only historical context, but also in contemporary architectural um, urban, political, environmental challenges are facing Jordan and, and actually the world today. So thank you so much. All right, hey everyone, I'm Skylar Tibbetts. I'm faculty here in architecture and I'm sw split between the computation group and architecture and design. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about an option studio called Space Architectures. Uh, from the architecture side, that's myself and Nicholas uh, from the Media Lab, it's Cody Page and David Newman. And from Aero Astro, it's uh, Jeffrey Hoffman, who's a five-time astronaut, uh, and Ed Crawley. So this has been a super interesting studio. We're connecting these three groups across campus, You know, our department, Aero Astro, and the Media Lab, um, combining engineering, science, and design and thinking about space architecture. So the first question is why space architecture? You know, why are we interested in that? And there's a few reasons. Um, one of them is that the ISS is being decommissioned supposedly in 2030. Um, and NASA now is fully focused on the Artemis mission to bring humans back to the moon and eventually to Mars. So there's basically an extreme focus and there's a need to design for the lunar habitat. Um, but the second one, we all have heard about the booming commercial space industry, whether that's SpaceX or Blue Origin or Virgin Galactic, and they're hiring architects. Uh, Philippe Stark has been hired for Axiom's new space station. Prada has the contract for the new space suit. Uh, you can look at the interiors of SpaceX. There's a growing market, and many of you or some of you might be hired in the future to the space architecture world. So we feel like it's important that we're training the future uh, alumni and future students to, to be uh, leading this field. And then the last one is that we need to be designing for humans, and we think that we're particularly well suited to do that. You know, if you look at 
the shuttle or the International Space Station, these are designed to keep people alive. They're designed for safety. They're designed for engineering, but they're not particularly designed for humans. So we need to rethink our relationship to, to outer space. At MIT, we think we're uniquely suited to do this. We have um, maybe the most or second most astronauts of any other place. Um, we have an amazing Aero Astro program. There's space initiatives at the Media Lab. Um, we have a long standing history and Nicholas wrote a book on the spacesuit. You know, there's a really interesting collaboration happening here across, uh, across campus and we think that we can take the lead on that. Um, Nicholas said, is at the edge of the possible where we find important lessons for what we need to do here on Earth? And I think that's important because it's not just about designing for the moon, it's about designing for extreme environments or even conventional everyday environments, but thinking about it in unconventional ways. So there's three phases to the studio. The first phase is probably what you've seen from lots of our architecture firms and colleagues around the world that have contracts with the European Space Agency or NASA. It's designing concepts, uh, it's program, it's uh, research, it's um, developing in their teams um, their proposals for lunar habitats. There's seven teams, they're split between engineers and architects both in the same team, um, and they each have different concepts for these lunar habitats. The second phase, which is what we're in right now, we're finishing this phase on Thursday, is a prototyping phase. So they're physically testing materials, fabrication systems, um, connection details, et cetera. And each group has to look at the whole spectrum from transportation and logistics to deployment to materials to radiation, thermal protection, life support systems. You know, Across their team, they need to be starting to test and prototype some of these aspects. And then where we're going starting next week and the, the final phase is building large scale demonstrations, large scale prototypes, you know, as close to one to one as possible. Likely they're not building, building fully functional systems in every respect, but you know, trying to scale up as much as they can. Um, and then most recently, uh, we had a lecture uh, by Carl Johan, who's a second year SMART student in our program who runs a company called Saga Space Architects. So just also coincidental. Um, and he has a lot of experience in this and talked to us about how he prototyped and built this and lived in this for three months um, in Greenland. Last week, we just got back from our trip. As you hear, a lot of the Option Studios travel. So we went, we had a space travel road trip in Texas. So we went to Brownsville to see SpaceX. Um, we got a kind of behind the scenes tour of their factory and how they're building their rockets. Um, then we went to Houston to see NASA's JSC and Mission Control and the big pool where they have a full one-to-one -one scale version of the International Space Station. We saw the Saturn V rocket. Um, then we went to uh, Austin to see ICON, who's the leading 3D printing housing company, but they have a big contract with NASA to do printing on the moon. So we talked to them about um, their future vision for, for lunar habitats. And then a very quick slide on some of the concepts. I was saying we have seven teams. Um, we have everything from inflatable temporary habitats to lunar regolith sandbags to reusing Sp SpaceX's um, Starship rocket for habitats, a mobile RV group, um, casting regolith into glass blocks and inflatable that can go into lava tubes and then uh, self-assembled habitat. So we have a bunch of different concepts. Each one of those teams is made up of engineers and designers. They're prototyping it and now moving towards larger scale. All right, thank you. Hey everyone, good morning. It's uh, very good to be with you. Uh, today in both on here in this busy room and on the screen for those who are joining remotely. My name is Rania Rossan. I'm an associate professor of architecture and urbanism here at MIT and founder of the practice uh, Design Earth, where our work seeks to expand how we conceive, imagine, and respond to the climate crisis uh, through the speculative architecture project. At MIT, you'll encounter me as I teach in the SMARCs and the MARC programs, so in courses, whether the SMARCs Urbanism a Pro Seminar, which is open also to MARC students, seminars and workshops on themes such as geodesign or landscapes of energy, but also in a series of design uh, research uh, methods courses, which not unlike the thesis um, experience and the thesis prep, 
teaches you how to engage the tools of architecture and urban design to use them in terms of research, theory, speculation, and practice in the world. So let's see how this is going to go. OK. So I'll, is there a way we can have slightly some volume? Maybe. All right. Maybe not. Is it possible to have volume? So I'm here today to tell you a few things about um, MIT architecture thesis, its distinctive feature, but also what uh, characteristics of its excellence. So thesis is a one-year arc of which begins in um, the spring semester of your third year with a thesis prep course and ultimately culminates in a public presentation and a broad school celebration in the fall of your fourth year. So I thought it's appropriate for us to start there in that moment of um, celebration. And um, there's a few moments where you can hear maybe snippets at a later point in the voice. Otherwise, I'll um, continue to uh, describe to you that experience. So this short video captures that day in its full glory and the incredible energy that thesis here at MIT is. Of course, you've heard earlier today that thesis is quite um, significant to the experience of the Institute at large. Um, the MIT website calls the soul of MIT is actually a research. So it's broadly the institute, but also our department that has a wonderful reputation for fostering creativity, as you've seen not least in the series of uh, core studios and option courses, critical discourse, experimentation, entrepreneurship, and collaboration that crisscrosses what are relatively porous boundaries between discipline groups and across uh, departments. So thesis will be the culmination of your time and of your design research experience here at MIT. After core and option studio, every student in the MARC program is required to produce an independent thesis that is guided by an advisor and a reader. So you will work to identify research projects that are relevant to your own concerns, to the world, and it's now and to um, architecture's agency, both established and potential. And you know, when we look at these projects together, and of course, you you know, you can go back and see it on um, our uh, web platforms that document this pro this uh, day, either uh, our YouTube issue or other media platforms where you could actually tune into the conversation. But what you could quickly get a sense of is the how um, diverse the projects are and how um, it, they begin to engage a, a, a wide array of concerns, um, methods of work, uh, scales, but also media and material outputs that includes, of course, um, buildings, interiors, uh, exhibition setups, furniture, books, software, performance, and environments. So there's a few things here at MIT that allow us to pursue thesis in this individual way, which might not be possible for other uh, peer schools. One is, of course, the intimate scale of the MARC program. So you choose to enroll and grow with a group of a cohort of around 23 students, which allows faculty to dedicate the time and resources for individual weekly conversations. Um, but also the faculty expertise across the design discipline groups. Um, the history theory criticism, building technology, uh, computation, um, are some of the best faculty support that you can get in this process to kind of develop your argument, the design methodology, test it and fine tune it in various uh, media formats. So you'll basically, in the course of this thesis prep semester, be setting your own brief for a semester of a studio exploration that you yourself will be conducting. So what are the questions that you would be asking? And of course, the department has a series of awards that um, recognize thesis prep and projects. Um, and you know, there's the uh, Rosemary Grimshaw Award for Thesis Prep, but also the Imri Halas Thesis Prize 
with you know, a couple of recent projects by Olivier Faber and Tim Cousin on thermal collective and architectural imaginaries beyond modern control or Jill Sunshine on medium resolution, which operates within uh, the surface condition, accepting it as a geographic paradigm necessary to respond to emerging material qualities, uh, as well as a broader Arthur Rocher Price. Um, and I'm happy to tell you more about it. I know there's a few um, booklets that are around that give you a sense of an abstract and an image for each MR project that has been run over the past few years. These are also available online if you're joining us remotely. So I thought, okay, all of this sounds super exciting, and but maybe slightly a bit overwhelming when thinking of what would really be my thesis experience, especially if um, I haven't had necessarily a design research training per se. Anna started by saying that you're thinking of, you know, you'll be practicing writing, you'll be also in a series of design studio, but how will we go around figuring that? Um, now, of course, some of you might bring into the MR program specific research interests from your own recent professional experience or from an undergraduate thesis that you've completed. But most of you will actually grow your research experiments here at MIT. Um, so thesis might not be taught per se, it's guided, but design research can be uh, rehearsed, and it's going to be rehearsed through a series of incredible um, studios, workshops, seminars, opportunities for research, research assistantships, including a series of immersive international experience um, and um, a series of interrelated processes of thinking, making, thinking, making, that are all kind of uh, related in the way that they go back and forth. So maybe I'll share with you kind of quick snippets of how this is coming about, at least this semester, and I'll share with you a sense of you can't hear them. So you'll. Lost. Um, Repair. <laughs> Repair. Go. Utility. Signaling. Material and fabrication. Um, I mean, if it's one word, it's drugs. If it's two words, public house. Uh, the senses. <laughs> Land. Uh, life cycles. Life cycles. Migration. Emigration. A thing. A thing. Thermal artifact. Nostalgia. Nostalgia. Evolution. Comfort. Comfort. Solutions. All right, so just a quick sense at the beginning of a semester of really a very rough one word association from the cohort that is this year's third year um, thesis prep. So these are the students who will be completing in the fall that you know, you'll get to celebrate and see the work with them if, you, if you're joining us next year. But I, you know, the, the idea is that you're starting this process before your summer to give you enough time to settle into questions, advisors, relationships, research, travel if necessary. But through this spring semester, there's a series of, um, it's a series of guided uh, design research exercises through which you begin to refine initial ideas into a coherent proposal that makes what you will and us and your advisors collectively believe to be a significant contribution to the discipline. So how do you begin to identify and outline the context within historical, cultural, political, economic, and technological processes situated within the discipline's concerns, methods, and agencies to begin to run um, relevant and deliberate forms of design experiments towards a series of a set of media and uh, towards an intended audience. So basically, why does thesis matter to you? Why does it matter to architecture? And why does it uh, matter to the world now? And of course, we think of those as Liam had started beyond kind of the specific uh, pedagogic structures that uh, you're deploying in this one year arc to be more like a, a set of rehearsals of matters of concern and methods of operation that could become part of your own practice. So kind of setting maybe a seed for a career that is long and productive afterwards, whatever you set up that career to be in professional practice or innovative startups, critical pedagogies, amongst them of the many career paths of our distinguished alum, um, some of which continue to join us here and kind of um, 
uh, teach the next generation. MIT has a fabulous resource called DSpace. Uh, so there you can kind of look into all theses that have been submitted all in the format of a book publication and you might begin to uh, familiarize yourself with that uh, legacy, kind of with the imagination of where your book might be there. But there's a the few that might uh, uh, ring a bell in terms of our kind of prestigious set of alums. And uh, yeah, thank you. We're happy to uh, answer any questions that you have and continue the conversation during the day. So this concludes our uh, MARC session. Um, I invite you to bring all your questions to lunch. Um, many of the faculty will be there and we can continue the conversations there. As I understand it, next we have a short presentation by the financial team. Nope. Is that, I might be looking at a, First, we wanted to introduce our friends from the library. Hello, I'm Kai Alexis Smith. I am the architecture and planning librarian. I am very excited because I like to work with the students on their research and scholarly needs. And I also get to work with a number of the uh, thesis classes here in the architecture department. So I support the students in teaching them some research strategies. And I'm lucky to be able to work with some pretty incredible people here at Roach Library and also the number of the other libraries we here, have here on campus. So I'm going to pass it to my colleagues, but also come back at two o'clock because we're going to give a little tour of Roach Library and you get to learn about the fabulousness here. Thank you, Kai. Hi, my name is Amy Nernberger. I am the interim head for data and specialized services in the libraries. Like Kai said, we're here in the libraries to support your success, to work with you for your success in your studies, in your research, in your scholarship, while you would be at MIT and beyond. And so in the data and specialized services area, we have a number of programs and services to work with you on that. As it says in the name, data. It's all about the data, the evidence, right? You need data stuff, come see us. If we don't have it, we probably know who does. We can get you the connections there. We also oversee the GIS and data lab, which come back at two, like Kai said, and you can tour the gloriousness of that particular space. We also have geographical information systems, which Paxton will be talking about in just a second, data management services, and statistical services. So, so a touch on data management services in that space, we work with you to increase the impact and effectiveness of your scholarship your research as, as you go through, as you go through your time here, as you think about how you want to extend that beyond your time at MIT, if you come to MIT. And really that's through the appropriate management of your research materials, of your scholarly manner. So Paxton. Good morning all, uh, my name is Paxton LaJoy. As Amy mentioned, I'm on the GIS team. I'm the GIS specialist for MIT libraries. Uh, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems, so essentially taking geospatial data, making things like maps. Uh, so if at any point uh, at MIT you have any questions or work with GIS or remote sensing, satellite imagery, anything relating to geospatial data, uh, you're always welcome to come to the GIS and Data Lab. We'll talk a bit more about it on the tour later if you happen to be able to join. But uh, we host workshops, we do one-on-one -on -one consultations, and we help everybody around campus with their geospatial needs. Hello everyone, my name is Gwendolyn Colasso and I'm collections curator over at the Aga Khan Documentation Center, which is right below us. And there we have a collection that focuses on built environments of Muslim societies. So if this is a main interest to you or perhaps of comparative interest, do stop by. We have extensive archives with some of the largest figures in um, architecture in the Middle East, such as Rafat Chatterjee and Muhammad Makia, towering figures in uh, modernism in the region. And we also have a growing collection of 
artist books, rare books, and we also work on a number of exhibitions on campus, including one that's going up next year in my Hagen Gallery, which will be on some of the historic Roach Art collections. And in more exciting veins, we also run experiments on some of these historical collections with our Department of Material Science and Engineering in order to learn more about the composition and production of uh, historical architectural elements. So if any of these topics interest you, do stop by, send us an email. We'd be happy to work with you on your research projects or just explore some of the collections we have. Looking forward to seeing you. Stop by it too. Yes, come back at two for their tours. <laughs> and now we have some of our staff to talk about some of our finances. Yep. Hi, everybody. My name is Jackie Dufault. I'm the Director of Administration and Finance, and I help to manage our entire wonderful team of staff of about 20 who make this department run. So I know that we're a little bit tight on time, so I'm going to do a few introductions and then hand it over to my team. So we have Doug Levy, who's the fiscal officer. Financial questions here. We have Alan Reeves, who is, uh, who is our amazing help. Like He makes everything run as well. So Alan is another contact for financial things. We also have Michelle here from Student Financial Services. This has to do with loans. Um, so we don't handle the loan aspect of things. Us three, we handle more of the, um, you know, your TA ships and, find, you know, like the package that you're getting. But then Michelle will be able to help with other things. Um, I know that Michelle has to get going, so if you want to give a brief hello, she will be at our open, like our office hours between one and two in our head office, where I will be as well, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, and Michelle will be there too, but handing over to you real quick. Hi guys, thanks for your time today. I just wanted to come by, introduce myself, let you know that um, I'm here and I have a team um, who's here to support you as well. Um, our goal is to help you make um, positive financial decisions when you're planning to attend. So we do have resources for building out personal budgets, talking through options for loans, talking through different impacts on that loan eligibility depending on um, funding from the department. But we're, we're here for you as a resource and so just know that you can reach out and we're happy to chat and I'll be here later. <laughs> Thanks guys. Oh, good morning everyone. So I'm Doug Levy. I'm the fiscal officer in the department. I just wanted to um, welcome you all today and again. And uh, so what we want to do is just kind of go through some of the frequently asked questions that we receive surrounding the uh, admissions, the offer letter that was sent out to you. So some of the questions you may have had, we hopefully answer those before you hear. And as Jackie said, we will have an um, office hours from one to two today. If you have any more questions that you want things more elaborated on, we can certainly work individually with you. So first and foremost, what I just wanted to announce, uh, I just saw the new rates for tuition have been posted. So uh, the tuition rate for next academic year for the full year is 61990 so before you have sticker shock, we're going to walk through the, the actual admission offers and how your uh, offer impacts what that tuition component is and what will be covered and what won't be covered. Okay, so and Alan's going to walk through some of those scenarios with us now. So again, we are a little up against it against time. So if you do have questions, I would ask you to save them till the end. Hopefully we'll answer them as we go through. Okay. So uh, fellowship tuition awards. So uh, tuition awarded in your offer letter will be dispersed directly into your bursar's accounts in two installments before the fall and spring term bills are sent out. So the fall semester would be in August and the spring semester bill in December. Uh, as Doug said, the current tuition rate is uh, 61990 uh, making it three, the uh, thirty thousand nine hundred ninety-five per term. Uh, so for fellowship stipends, these are paid. Um, fellowship stipends. I want to mention that the the fellowship tuitions are sent to the bursar's account directly to your bursar's account twice twice a semester, and the amount that is sent to that is depending on what was in your letter. So for example, if you had a 75% tuition award, yeah. so if you had a 75% tuition award and with your offer letter or an 80% uh, tuition offer fellowship and with your letter, then 
basically for the term, then 80% of that tuition would be sent to the birth of the of the term. So if the tuition for term is 30,995 and you had an offer letter that said you were going to receive 80% tuition for that term, then you would pay the difference. Okay. So that's why I'm saying the total tuition is 61,990 for the for the whole academic year. But if your offer letter said you were receiving an 80% tuition fellowship award, then you would only pay the remaining 20% of that tuition. Okay. And then in addition. So um, yeah, fellowship stipends. So these are paid uh, in bi-monthly installments directly to the student with no work requirement. So this may be used to help uh, defray your costs, so such as uh, insurance, student life fees, uh, food, etc. Um, you will be required to set up a U.S. bank account uh, for the stipend to be deposited into. So these payments are not sent directly to your bursar's accounts. Um, as mentioned, it will be bi-monthly uh, payment starting in September through May, and will be paid in equal installments on the 15th and the last day of the month. Um, so for our, our TAs and RA jobs guaranteed at all, uh, no, but you are eligible to apply in most cases. Uh, keep in mind, some outside fellowships may have an impact in your eligibility, and your eligibility will be reviewed should you apply uh, for a TV or be offered a TA, uh, R, an NRA position. Uh, so um, if you receive a TA and RA, uh, these positions are now governed under, under the new CBA Student Union Policy. So, which includes um, stipend rates, union dues, grievances, et cetera. Uh, the department will, uh, the department has assigned student, student union reps, um, and we could provide you with a list uh, of who your student rep is if you have any questions or concerns about the new student CBA agreement. Uh, so, uh, if you receive a 50% TA for the semester, how is this paid and what is the dollar amount you uh, you would receive? So approximate, approximately 30 to 45 50% uh, TA positions are posted each term for students to apply to. Uh, a 50% TA position for one semester has a work expectation of 10 hours per week and would pay a monthly sal salary of 2,116. Uh, so for the total of the term, that's 9522 uh, Just like fellowship stipends, uh, payments for the TA positions will be made directly to the student and by monthly installments on the 15th and the last day of the month. Uh, appointment dates. So the, for the fall semester, it's September 1st through to January 15th. And the spring semester is from January 16th to May 31st. Uh, TA positions also would cover your extended medical insurance. So for a four each term, uh, should you hold a TA position um, and the insurance will be sent directly to your bursar's accounts. Uh, our current extended medical rates for the fall term is 1,802 and the spring term is 1,888. Uh, and these will be updated for the new year um, soon. Um, how does this impact your fellowship stipend? Um, do you want to touch base on that? Yeah. OK, so in the um, admissions letters that went out, it stated that if you were to if you were to secure a TA position or an RA position from the department uh, during a term that the if you and you addition, your letter stated that you would be receiving a ten thousand dollar stipend for the academic year, which means it's five thousand per term the way it's paid out. So in the, in the term in which you hold a, a TA position, for example, uh, that Five thousand dollars stipend would be reduced to twenty five hundred, but you would also, but you would be receiving the full um, tuition. You would be receiving. I'm sorry. You'd be receiving the full stipend for the TA. So, unfortunately, it's something the department has to do financially in order to 
given the limited funds that we have and the financial aid packages that we give out. But I also want to just stress that the um, the TA positions and RAs do also come with insurance as well. So that would be a component that would be covered that you wouldn't have to pay out of pocket for that. Um, so uh, that's the way they're currently working is that uh, under our current financial situation, we have to reduce the stipend and the semesters in which you hold a TA or an RA that's funded by the department. And then if the next semester you're not doing the TA, the stipend would go back to the $5,000 for the next term. Right, so you wouldn't lose it going forward. Um, and then from there, I'm gonna give it back to Alan. We're kind of up against it at 11, so we're gonna, yeah, right, we have to be yeah. constantly another time. So you're here, how many jobs you can hold? Yeah, uh, so also, so we have, uh, you already touched base on hourly positions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. so there are hourly paid positions which pay uh, an hourly rate of $22 an hour, such as shop monitor positions, tour guides, communication, uh, publications and DEB assistance. So these are usually 10 hours uh, a week positions uh, and faculty may also offer hourly paid positions. So uh, how many jobs can you work in a semester? Uh, students are limited to one full-time position per term. However, you may combine positions up to 20 hours a week maximum during the fall and spring semesters. So what this means is you can have any combination of TAs, RA positions, as long as you follow the 20 hours a week uh, maximum guideline. Uh, with that being said, um, as mentioned, 50% uh, position uh, is usually 10 hour a week commitment and 100% is 20 hours max. Um, how is health insurance paid uh, and how does it come out of the 10K directly? So. Uh, these are billed per semester to the student and would not be deducted from the uh, 10K fellowship stipend. Uh, is medical insurance covered and is it an additional cost? Uh, it is an additional cost and would only cover, would only be covered by the department should you be selected by 50% or more TA or RA. Uh, hourly paid positions do not come with medical coverage. Um, yeah, so yeah. So, um, do we have time for a couple of questions, or are we need are we up against it? Does anyone have any questions for Doug or Alan? You can also find them later during our open office hours. Okay. So yes, uh, we will be available from one to two if you have any direct questions. Um, what we talked about today, and I would ask you to just go back to your uh, missions letter and see if any you know if this ties into the questions that you may have had about the tuition and how it's paid to you and uh, what the cost will be for those. Uh, as I said, we will uh, also, if you know you do decide to come, hopefully you all do, uh, we will also be having an orientation that will do a lot more in depth, you know, uh, presentation of how this all works and how it all comes together. Uh, and then we will also have um, Michelle from Financial S uh, Services will also be available today for the office hours to ask, answer any questions about how we, how uh, they handle the tuition side on their ends and talk about any loans that you might have to apply for and things like that. Okay. Right. Thank you, Doug. So and thank Alan. you guys for everything. And then before, before uh, Anna gets started with the SMARCS session, if anyone wants to join the tour of the Met building, we ask you to go ahead and um, leave now. Diana will escort you down to the lobby to meet up with Jim. So, hello, everyone. I'm Anna Miljacki, now wearing the hat of the SMARCS director and the director of the SMARCS architectural design. Congratulations on your admission to MIT. It is great to have you gathered or have us gathered. Uh, and hello to uh, anyone who's watching online. I'm going to introduce the program in broad strokes uh, across all discipline groups that are part of the SMARCS program. Um, and, uh, and I'm starting with a, you know, an image of basically a thesis prep event or, or class yesterday, just so you have a sense of sort of what goes on in the daily life of SMARCS. Uh, logistically, uh, the description of, this, of the SMARCS program is um, 
uh, as a two-year program of advanced study founded on research and inquiry in architecture as a discipline and as a practice. Every discipline group has this, these two lines. You've probably read them somewhere uh, online. The program is intended both for students who already have a professional degree in architecture and for uh, those interested in, in advanced non-professional graduate study, but this uh, sort of definition has different emphasis in different discipline groups that you might have applied to or been accepted to. Across all of the disciplines, we prepare students for careers in research, design, and teaching. I'm going to go back to a quote, or actually, yes, Nicholas did have this quote, uh, to a quote by William Ware to, to set us up a little bit. Um, and as you now heard, in conceiving the first School of Architecture in the United States, uh, architect William Ware pledged MIT to a very important task of producing architecture and architects worthy of the future. Future is, of course, always part of architects' prospective task. Uh, it is constitutive of architectural thinking, and it has been summoned repeatedly throughout history as the framework and the topic of hallucinating as well as willing new worlds, near and far beyond the present. More importantly, Ware's qualifier binds architecture and future through qualitative judgment, inviting us to contemplate futures worth living, architectures worthy of those futures, and the criteria for evaluating them. The SMARCS program at MIT is therefore a laboratory in which we speculate on diverse forms of agency for future architectures. Future is not a singular construct. Of course, you have encountered it in various ways in your education thus far. In my mind, the most useful contemporary conception of future may be as a series of increasingly dire prospects marching towards us, all collateral outcomes of the naive faith of previous eras in unfettered progress. These include major migrations induced by climate change and patterns of global economy, extreme weather, resource depletion, uneven and unjust distribution of economic means, crumbling infrastructure, pollution, and so many other forms of alienation. Turning these prospects into opportunities or ensuring better prospects for all will require many types of architectural projects of different temperaments and temporalities. And this is where the SMARCS program comes in. Together, MIT faculty, guest critics, um, and students cultivate expertise, sensibilities, and critical questioning necessary to deliver a variety of different things that I wanna access in a second on my, <laughs> give me a sec. Ah, there it is, I see it. Come, come to me. Oh, geez, okay. So together, MIT faculty, guest critics, and students cultivate expertise, sensibilities, and critical questioning necessary to deliver architectural objects with specific effects and affects. Architecture is an active participant in the production of urbanity and of material culture. Understanding and shaping of political and environmental territories, architecture as the agent of industry's transformation, architecture as a means to address largest societal questions, to critically intervene in discourse, to induce hesitation in various practices of daily life, and rewire the patterns of understanding and living. T, technology, given primacy in the name of our institution, is simply a fact of life in all of these architectural domains. It solves problems as often as it creates them. But our historical understanding and experience of this at MIT sets us up with an enormous advantage in the contemporary landscape of architectural academia. As researchers, authors, producers, MIT faculty work on the edges where the present turns into future. But as pedagogues, we embrace the future by trusting our students whose thinking and sensibility will by definition defy the standards of the present. So in terms of students, we currently have 53 SMARC students. That's both first and second year students. Eight of those students are from the US, which is 15% of the group. 
and 45 are international, or 85% of the SMARCS program is international. The numbers break down unevenly across different discipline groups. This means that we have uh, eight SMARCS architectural design, five SMARCS ACPIA students currently, five BT SMARCS, 12 SMARCS computation, four SMARCS HTC, and 17 SMARCS urbanism. This roughly divides into 50-50 female-male insofar as we understand how uh, the gender is sort of understood by the participants in the program. So what I want to do in the next few slides is stress, illustrate, and celebrate a few things about the program. Uh, most importantly, the diversity of research in the program, both in terms of urgent topics that SMARC students tend to take up, and in terms of the very definition of research across different discipline groups. So these key words that we use to describe the, the SMARCS program or the SMARCS activity, research and inquiry, as you will see uh, in the student work that follows, take a different form and follow different methodologies and epistemic frameworks. It might be useful to distinguish the logic of the SMARCS program from our professional MARC program. While all the discipline groups contribute to and intersect with the MARC program in order to indeed constitute its cur curriculum, in the SMARCS program, or for this degree in the Master of Science in Architectural Studies, which is called the same for all of you at the end of the day, uh, each discipline group provides the pedagogical and research framework and guidance and ensures the depth of research uh, and inquiry. So while they sort of arrive to MARC, they each uh, result in a kind of a cohort of yearly SMARC students across these discipline groups, but also cultivate students within the logics of resp the, our respective discourses, often together with PhD students, depending on the, on the program, and in close collaboration with faculty in the same area. So I want to introduce the people who lead the discipline groups, uh, because for the most part, they are also the leaders of different uh, SMARCS, discipline, uh, SMARCS uh, yeah, discipline group cohorts and so that you can recognize them, reach out to them, and address questions to them. So I'm starting here, so you know already who I am. This is Rafi Segal, who's uh, running the SMARCS Urbanism program. He's sitting here, you can say hi. Uh, Krista Reinhardt, who is leading the SMARCS BT. Um, Larry Sass, who is our SMARCS Computation uh, Director. Timothy Hyde, you can say. And uh, Nasser Rabat. So all of us are uh, working on this together. We constitute the uh, SMARCS uh, committee together, and uh, we are joined in that by Skylar Tibbetts, whom you've met already. He is uh, straddling between architectural design and computation, but also he teaches the first important uh, collective uh, collo colloquium for all of you. And I'm going to go to the to this slide and maybe have Skylar if you want to say something about the colloquium briefly. Yeah, so colloquium is the first class that all incoming SMARCs take. So across all the discipline groups, you all come together. Um, and the first several days you present to each other and get to know each other. You know, what are your backgrounds? What are your interests coming to MIT? And then the rest of the semester, second year SMARCs or PhDs come to present to you. So then you get an idea of what research is happening. The second years are just starting their thesis process. And so you give them feedback on that. You, you know, you're a focused audience and it's the first time in many cases that they're presenting the work. You're getting to see what's happening. And we also invite one faculty each week to join and the faculties from across the different discipline groups. And we have a conversation with them to understand what is their work, what is their background, what are their interests. And that way you then start to know a number of faculty who can be potential thesis advisors or you know, you can start to work with them in the future. Thank you, Sky. So I know how hard it is to read this in this room. So don't worry, uh, you will uh, have access to it and there Kateri is holding up um, the printed copies of it. What we are presenting to you is a draft or when you can, you can when you, as you walk out, you can have the draft for the 2024-25 curriculum, which only applies to you. It doesn't apply to people who are uh, currently in the program. So we have to uh, make sure that's clear to everyone. 
So the key thing to know about this is that each discipline group has four to six required classes, which include thesis prep, thesis, uh, the colloquium that uh, we just mentioned, a methods class or a class that helps set the groundwork in the discipline you're entering. If you study the map, you will see that there are some alignments between the discipline groups. Uh, and the key among them really are the two capstone sort of moments. One, the colloquium that starts you off, and the other is the thesis that ends the, the two-year cycle that you're entering. And, and that thesis, we uh, uh, celebrate, in that moment, we celebrate the entire cohort and uh, with guests and, and with you observing the process. So I have some images from earlier eras of just slightly before the pandemic and then contemporary work, but I want to run through some examples of the work that, um, that, that arrives at the end of those two years. So you have a, a sense of how that is different across different discipline groups and, and how it might be sort of kindred to what you're already thinking about. Um, all SMART students will work with two to three committee members. One of those will be your advisor uh, on, on the thesis project. And as I already said, the thesis work varies both in terms of the topics that SMART students tend to take up and in terms of the very definition of research across different discipline groups. Um, they have taken the form, like here, of thinking about transmission of patterns, historical patterns in pattern books or historical thinking in pattern books, but also graphically across contemporary media in architecture. In the context of SMARCS AD, this involves both thinking about cultural, technical, and, um, and aesthetic questions uh, in a variety of different media. Uh, during the pandemic, we had a number of theses that were uh, resulting in a kind of a video outcome. And here you're seeing uh, stills from a set of films uh, from a project that was dwelling on old self-built books in Mexico while considering the kind of contemporary constraints of, of building in that context as well. And the, the student is Rodrigo uh, Escandon Cesarman, who curated the Mexican pavilion this last Venice Biennale and is also a partner in a Mexico City firm, A-P-R-D-E-L-E-S-P. Uh, then there are projects that have dealt with um, sort of recladding and reuse and rethinking the facade on a variety of different registers. Uh, projects that have been interested in collaborating with robots, both for uh, technical and aesthetic reasons. Um, projects that, like this one, uh, a thesis, uh, an, an awarded project that dealt with a kind of a garage space for learning and teaching. And Mariana Gonzalez uh, Cervantes is teaching right now in Texas. Um, project like Mohammed, you met Mohammed now uh, earlier, uh, representing or teaching uh, an option studio this time. Uh, but uh, here is the moment of his uh, SMARCS thesis. He uh, went uh, and walked the length of Lebanon uh, at night, thinking about what one could see, uh, collecting stories and thinking about a kind of a night sky view that contains both mythologies and sort of actual built environments uh, around it. Um, he has uh, been a teaching fellow at MIT and then has taught in core option as well as a SMARC's thesis prep project. Or here's a project by Zachary Schumacher, who was interested in a kind of intersection or collaboration between bodies, uh, uh, tools, and algorithms. Uh, he is teaching in various places uh, from New York right now. Then, okay, this is way too, it breaks my heart to see it this light. Um, but uh, in architecture and urbanism, uh, Students uh, are interested in developing critical urban design and as well as history and theory. And you are seeing an, a little snippet of Gabriel Kozlovsky's thesis, also awarded. He is currently uh, getting his PhD at the GSD, uh, but he also participated in the Venice Biennale as a curator of the Brazilian Pavilion uh, a couple of cycles ago, and then also, or maybe more than a couple of cycles ago, and then a couple of cycles ago, he was an ass assistant curator uh, with Hashim Sarkis on the Biennale. Um, basically, in some of this work, um, 
students take up questions like soil in Amazonia, dust in Nepal, uh, mining in Armenia, water in India, and uh, as well as a, a question of queer space or queering space in the context of uh, New York urbanity. Uh, Malcolm Rio is currently getting his PhD at GSAP Columbia and also teaching at RISD. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of a kind of what happens next for some of these people as we go through uh, the work. Uh, SMARC's uh, BT explores ways to use design and technology to create buildings that contribute to a more humane and environmentally responsible built world. That's the kind of overarching uh, position of the discipline. And here you're seeing uh, some of the work that deals with inventing new ways of building. Uh, and David Costanza is currently on a tenure track at Cornell. Some theses tend to take on measurement, testing, lab work, and uh, produce scientific papers to propose smarter techniques in building. Uh, Mohammed Ismail is now on a tenure track uh, at University of Virginia. And uh, Alpha is uh, at tenure track at Northeastern. There are uh, questions about how to make things better, more, more efficiently, and, uh, and, and transform the kind of thinking and the industry uh, from this angle. I am using an image which actually looks a lot, like everything I'm showing you, everything looks so much better on my computer right now. Uh, but, <laughs> but this is an image uh, uh, from Schuyler's thesis, thinking about uh, self-assembly and now running the self-assembly lab at MIT and all kinds of other things you've already heard. Uh, the computation group uh, describes its sort of work as inquiry into the varied nature and practice of computation in architectural design and ways in which design meaning, intention, and knowledge are constructed through sensing, thinking, and making computationally. Uh, sometimes there are tools that are developed in this realm, processes and theories, and, uh, and these are applied in creative, socially meaningful responses uh, to challenging design questions. There are projects that have attempted to figure out human to computer interaction in a variety of ways, here through intuitive gesturing uh, in digital production, or uh, for example, figuring out what the Bedouins are doing in the desert of Israel. Uh, Nof, uh, uh, Nothanson basically uh, developed a set of cameras to record and help kind of follow what Bedouins are interact or how Bedouins are interacting in the context of the desert with authorities. They have to keep moving. And so this was a, an attempt to develop structures for them. Uh, she is currently teaching in, at the Negev School of Architecture in Israel, and that school is populated mostly by, or very, or in large part by Bedouins from the Negev Desert. Um, this particular project by uh, Miles was uh, arguing that EAC industry must use automation methods that originate from established manufacturing processes to expand the creative output of the discipline also an awarded thesis. And then there are things like this, which you cannot see at all. Um, that's an extremely specific, highly precise proposal for liquid metal printing, which was developed across computation and mechanical engineering. Uh, and uh, I wanted to say that, you know, I, I am a sucker for images, so I'm showing you an image, but not the kind of uh, mathematical equations that are, that are uh, densely packed in this particular uh, thesis. Zane, who was an MARC student first uh, at MIT, then a teaching fellow, is currently uh, uh, in the PhD program at ETH. Most of HTC work takes on historical and theoretical topics in architecture and art, relying on archives and historical narratives, like this recent project on the seeding of specific kind of ownership and architecture into the American dream, and conversely, the socialist activism among US architects, uh, which was revising the longstanding notion that in the US, modernism is cleaned of its ideological baggage. 
uh, or this project that was dealing with kind of the meaning uh, and uh, the fates of memorial parks in Japan, um, or another one about pipelines. The Aga Khan program for Islamic architecture at MIT is uh, unique uh, and designed to promote, sustain, and increase the teaching of architecture in the Islamic word world. So here you're seeing just an excerpt from the thesis that was uh, telling a story about women or presence of women in the book of games. Or another one that was looking at palaces in Iran. Uh, or another one that uh, is looking at world building in Thousand and One Nights story or book. So you don't have to worry about this yet, um, but uh, it happens fairly fast. The thesis uh, semester arrives uh, quickly, uh, and we have been streamlining and, streamlining and aligning some of the timelines uh, across different, uh, different SMARCS activities so that uh, we can, in fact, build out a cohort or, or kind of a socialize the cohort of, uh, of SMARCS across different discipline groups. I wanted to introduce you also to another dimension of life as a SMARCS uh, student, which is um, TAing. And so a lot of our SMARC students uh, TA courses across different, across the department, including design courses. And uh, this is a studio that I took to Belgrade last year this time, in which uh, Ekin, who is currently uh, in thesis, SMARCS, uh, second year SMARCS, was a TA and a really important member of uh, the group. And as you saw maybe in the, in the MARC studios, we had studios that just came back from Mexico. The studio has a SMARCS uh, TA and uh, Amazonia also with a SMARCS TA. So that is a, a dimension of sort of uh, preparing you both to for a potential career in teaching, but also it, uh, it kind of enmeshes your lives with the MRCs at the, in the department. And then finally, uh, we are constantly looking for opportunities to socialize and have some drinks together and celebrate. So that's my, that's my spiel for you today. I'm assuming that all of you are going with your uh, specific discipline group in immediately after this meeting. So you can save some of those specific questions for, for that meeting. But if you have anything that's on this larger level, please let me know. And you know, that doesn't rely on the quality of my images or this projector or... Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs>